sex is something that we oftentimes don't talk about openly. It's taboo to talk about. Even in my yoga practice, the deeper I go, there's no end. There's no end to what you can experience in this body of self. All right, y'all. Today we have a very special episode. I am here with Jeffrey Powell. And Jeffrey and I met, I think it was one week ago today, actually, mm. so kind of kind of randomly. We met at Chop Shop in Dallas. That's Chop Shop, right? Mm -hmm. Chop Original Shop, Chop Dallas. Shop, yeah. It is uh it's it's a health food place. They make really delicious bowls. And uh we just we met in line to the bathroom and we just started getting into a kind of a deep conversation, which I always enjoy uh throughout my day, especially if it's spontaneous. But um yeah, Jeffrey wanted to come on and, and just have a conversation. So Jeffrey, could you just tell us like a little more about you? who you are, more about your journey, just so people get more of an idea of who you are? Sure. Um, I mean, that could, that's an open-ended question. I could talk yeah, for an you hour. Can take, I could talk you for can two go minutes. You want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be concise. Um, so nothing's random. You know, you had made that comment about our rendezvous, but everything is coming together in this orchestration. And so that day I was really open to um, just my flow. And you among two or other people came into my experience that day that all were kind of related just to kind of our own progress or spirituality or, you know, whatever anyone wants to call it. Um, and that's kind of how I view my life all day, every day. And how I got to that place was, um, you know, that's where the story is. We all have a story and it's all leading us to our deeper awareness of self. But the the kind of concise version of it would be... Um, you know, I, I had experiences that were leaving me confused a long time ago, a decade ago, because I was following a paradigm that people were telling me to. And when I would follow that paradigm, my life was pretty miserable. But then when I would follow my heart and my soul, my life was beautiful and amazing. And it went event against conven conventional way of thinking, at least where I... Um, had grown up in Texas, but really seemingly around the world. And I didn't really understand, but I wanted to. And my life was like that. It was really extremely high and intense and amazing or really low. And like I said, it was it was like an opposition to what I had been conditioned to believe. And it culminated when I was um, in an incident, a wreck that uh, pretty much killed me. I literally died and then I kind of came back. And Immediately in the ICU, I had had my brother, he was the first one that showed up. I had him record me and I just said, record me. I don't know why. Intuitively, it was just coming through me. And I just basically said, you know, I'm going to come out of this better than I ever was. And that was setting the, that intention, like that would then propel me for the next few months of like radical experiences that I had. Um, and so that was kind of like the last situation where I was like, I got to, I'm figuring this out. Like, why? How does life really work essentially? And what is my path? What is my purpose? And that was a decade ago. Um, and then eventually I found my way into yoga. And once I got into yoga and eventually meditation, um, I started to understand how everything is an orchestration. Like our lives are kind of pre-paved. Um, nothing is coincidental. Like all the experiences that any of us have are leading us to that awareness of ourselves. And that is our kind of unlimited nature. And we come into this life with intentional limitations to reawaken to that truth. And then once we do, we're on a path in which we're helping others to reawaken to that truth as well. And that's why, like I was saying, our rendezvous was not random. Um, it was purely intentional. Um, but what that really culminated into, I think the, the, the other kind of, not caveat, but big piece to mention there is yoga was teaching me how to heal my body in ways that were seemingly impossible. But it wasn't going through yoga um, classes or anything. It was me having to learn what yoga meant to me. And uh, it's really just means to connect with body and self. And so when I did that, eventually it just kind of transpired into meditation. Um, mm -hmm. Yoga is kind of just moving meditation. And so then once I really delved into my meditation practice about five, six years ago, I was meditating about 15 hours a day, all day, every day. Once I found that connection, the source, God, universe, self, what any, whatever anyone wants to use as terminology, I just was, I was like, I have to just keep coming here until 
it feels right. And it was about a year and it took me about another year and a half to kind of reintegrate back into what normal life is or collective reality with everybody. And uh, yeah, I learned about my gifts. I learned about everything. I saw, you know, the whole picture in that period of time for my own life. And then also what I shared with you in our conversations is that we are, are we are all having our own unique experience of that, our current human paradigm. So while it's unique in our own stories, it's still the same experience relatively to each of us. And so I've been teaching ever since and whatever endeavor I pursue and everywhere I go, I can see and sense why, you know, I'm having that interaction and that experience. And when I first was sharing this with people years ago, it was like, man, it seems like so much work. It's so cerebral. And, and it was like, no, I mean, once you, it's like, once you know something, once you know how to walk, if, you know, someone was a if we were adults, we learned how to walk and people are like, man, it seems so hard. Like so much effort goes into that. Once you, once you know something and you do something, it's just second nature. It's Natural. part of nature. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's just kind of like what my life has been like. And in the last couple of years since Corona, a lot more people have become more self-aware and um, I won't get to that right now, but you know, when I was still meditating a lot, um, I, you, there's a collective consciousness that we all are essentially. And we, anyone can tap into it and kind of sense what's happening around the planet at any given time. Yeah. Um, and I could sense that something was coming. I didn't know exactly what it was, but then when Corona happened, it was, I could feel it was the same thing. And I could feel it was for our collective purpose and intention to kind of come together, but also really go within ourselves individually so that we could also understand who we each were and then how to relate that to to the collective and it's just a shift that's happening it's all for our betterment it still seems like chaotic and if you look at certain pieces of it but you know at the in the big picture it's it's for our collective awakening and har harmonious um uh, eventual state that we will be in uh, yeah. is that five years 10 years 50 i don't know but this yeah. is part of it so yeah i think yeah, that answers it yeah absolutely that's that's a good introduction to your headspace and, and where you're at and a little bit about your journey I, when we were going, when we were in line for the bathroom, I remember talking to you about the power of the breath. Yeah. And I remember asking you if you were considering, or if you've ever been to a Vipassana retreat before, because I just applied to go on a Vipassana retreat and you talked about the breath and you, you, you mentioned that you know, third eye meditation, Wim Hof breath, thinking about your breath or bringing bodily awareness or mindfulness. It's, it's all part of the same rooting of self-awareness, self-ascension through the breath. Yeah. So I was just hoping that you could talk more about the breath. When we spoke about the breath, Jeffrey, I felt that you, I, I felt literal like divine insight mm. coming from you in that moment mm. to where like, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it struck a chord with me to where I've, I've, I've thought about it every day since we talked about it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's had both a conscious and subconscious effect on my overall processing framework and well being. Yeah. So particularly how you spoke about how the breath can be self healing from a bodily standpoint and an emotional processing standpoint like our like our, our physical state and our spiritual state how the breath can heal both of those things when we root ourselves in our breath we can bring awareness to our bodily sensations what needs healing what needs work but then yeah. also the breath can heal our own insecurities and trauma and processing and like our spiritual brokenness the mm -hmm. breath can be a solution to both of that so sure. i would love for you to just speak more about that because you delivered such great insight before sure um there was a lot of energy coming through me when you were saying that. So yeah, the big asking and that's, that's, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I will, let me preface it with this, um, you know, in, in case somebody wants to understand, and this is what we're all doing when I say this stuff, it's just most people aren't aware of this. Um, but we're all kind of conduits for source, God, universe, whatever. But most of us are in our heads or we're in our limited uh, being. And uh, we're only flowing a big, a small portion of that. Sometimes when we're aware that we're doing it, um, we might feel it like excitement or, you know, tingling sensations on the surface of the body or internal uh, energy flow. Um, I'm aware of when it's happening and being called through me because I can feel the different energy 
uh, that moves through me and where it moves through me. And um, when I was learning all this, I didn't read anything. I never, I went through a yoga teacher training and we read a few books and, you know, teacher that I went through, he, he was more like a power yoga, like nothing that I was really drawn to. It was more of just like realizing that all the experiences I've having, I was having up until my life were like, there was more to it than what was on the surface. And my whole life, I never, I felt like I was this, there was this depth that I was always going to that nobody understood. And, yeah. and yeah. so then yeah. I went to the teacher training a decade ago that just made, it just opened my eyes a little bit. It was just like, seeing that I could peer beneath the surface and there was more people there. And so it just gave me that, 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 uh, space to do that. And so when I started doing all the meditation and this is related to what you're saying with the breath and the yoga, I just, I didn't know what to do because the injuries of my body were so extensive. And if I was to go through traditional yoga, whether it be vinyasa, hatha, power, yin, restorative, like I did some of those classes, I took less than 10 classes ever still to this day. Um, more so in the last year because I've been partnering with some people and stuff, but I just knew there was one thing and that was, I'm going to give myself, you know, space, an hour a day. And this started nine years ago, just to breathe into my body and to allow it to show me. And I didn't even really know at that time consciously that that's what I was doing. I just knew I needed to give myself space. And before all that, I'd been working out. I'd gone to the gym since I was 17, two hours a day you know, for years, I was huge. I was 240 pounds. I was just, wow. that was my like meditation, you know, for, for most of my life. And I would do extreme sports, but those are different. Those are surface. Those are external primarily yoga and meditation are internal. Yep. It's a completely different relationship to the body yep. and the breath. And so in all of my working out for all those thousands of hours, uh, you know, you're breathing in certain patterns, but it's a pattern. Like it's a pattern in itself. It's not intuitive and it's not coming from the inner space that's within us, the divinity that's within us. And so when I started to give myself this space, it, you know, I would intuitively find, find myself doing things like movements and whatnot. And then, you know, my awareness started to expand. My conscious awareness started to expand. I started to see myself beyond my body and my mind. And it just continued to get deeper and deeper. But what was interesting when I first started, it took years to, to draw those parallels. Like it seems so obvious once you go somewhere, once you've been somewhere, once you've done something, you're like, ah, it's so obvious. It's like elementary, but when you're going through the process, it takes time to like draw those conclusions and really draw those under those, those connections and understanding. Um, and then it wasn't until I did that whole year where I was doing like 15 hours a day where I realized, oh, this is everything. Like this is where my source is. This is where my truth is. And I kept going there periodically, but then like leaving it because it just wasn't clicking all the way. And most people do it in some way, like they might take baths, or they go to the gym or they run or whatever, where they're giving themselves space to be with themselves and the clarity is coming through, but they don't necessarily understand that it's where all of them is coming through. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, and I'm going to answer your question. This is all related. People will, um, you know, get that clarity but then they'll go and they'll play out that pattern and for a while, it could be days or weeks or months or even years sometimes until they finally have some kind of retreat or something that then resets that pattern and allows the new yeah, source yeah. to come through them. Okay. And then they go play that pattern out and yeah. then they come back and then so on and so forth. That's what I was doing in my life to an extreme degree. That was my path, like to understand what I know now. And it would play out in these incredible ways for, you know, six months or a year and then the opposite and then I would go and do something in my life and I would be a new person. And I would always have these new groups of people and, you know, like the transformations of Jeffrey, the iterations that I have been, has been lifetimes, lifetimes of people in one experience, you know, and I'm only in my thirties, but what I've experienced is literally like 50 plus lives already. And it was because I knew I was supposed to experience these things to consolidate and explain in a more concise way for people to understand the simplicity but also the complexity, it's this kind of paradox or duality um, of, of what you were getting into, which is the breath. And so what I was essentially saying to you in all of those experiences, it was the breath. The breath is the anchor, it is our first conscious connection or controller of ourselves to allow our true selves to come through. That's why if you think of anything, whether you're giving birth or you're working out or you're running or whatever, it's like breathe or breathe in this way but people don't really understand the complexity of it because it, it's just kind of overlooked. It's like, yeah, of course I'm breathing. 
Yeah. You know, I'm breathing. I need to breathe. Or, and most of the time we relinquish that control to our, you know, atomic or autonomic. Yeah. It's like uh, your heart beating. Yeah. But when you're in control of it and you're conscious of it in any given moment, you are then purely in awareness in the yes. present moment. And that's yes. really, but it's so hard like to understand what that really means. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're not practicing, and that's why, you know, I wrote a chapter for the University of North Texas in a book in 2018. It was like right after that year of meditation and, and all these opportunities were coming to me and I could see the, the divinity, like the universe will bring you what you are and what you are being, but it's on your path. People, and, I'll, and I'm going to digress for just a little bit, med- manifestations gotten a lot more popular the last couple of years, but people are trying to manifest from their ego, mm. not from their path. You don't yeah, have to from, manifest from the from, real source. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't have to manifest like all those techniques and tools are really to get people to understand just to be in alignment with mm-hmm. themselves. Because when you're fully in alignment, everything's just unfolding all the time. But then when you start getting into ego and you're like, I want to create this and you can do that, but is it from your highest path? Yeah. And I won't go into this subject right now entirely, but the point is that, you know, all these techniques are taking us back to what we are eventually all becoming. And that is in our true harmonious um, path with self and therefore all those around us. And then the universe will conspire to bring those things together that are also in harmony to fulfill your purpose in any given time. Um, And then you just are kind of enjoying your ride. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm just this vessel and I'm enjoying this persona that is Jeffrey and the conversations that I'm having and and it's always new and fresh in a different way. And, but when we're trying to control it too much, then, you know, we're not, and I'm not even saying out externally, even internally, people will try to control it in their manifestation. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the main point is breath is the anchor. And a lot of times, and especially when you listen to manifestation stuff in the last couple of years, you know, it's not really talked about that much. Um, people will use so many different techniques and stuff and none of them are wrong. It's just that breath is really what yeah. should be the anchor in everything, every single thing. Yeah. For for me, I think since we talked and you kind of sparked this within me, and I will say that another another thing <laughs> is that, that you gave me a lot of clarity about was that we are the ones who have to come to our own awareness. We are the ones that have to come to our own solutions you are a healer. Um, you, you, you do heal healing work and coaching work and you help people in, in a, in a direct relational way. But I think you are spot on with your mindset because you help people find the solutions themselves. Yeah. That's what we all need to do. Uh, but in terms of the breath, one of the things that you helped me identify for myself in that same spirit is that, by grounding myself in my breath, by yeah. taking as by really challenging myself also to take as long and deep breaths as I can, right? To to go against the the conditioning of our normal breath, which is just short spurts in the background, and mm-hmm. to to really have mindfulness of long breaths. What it does, Jeffrey, is it boosts my awareness. I become so much like my awareness is so clear, both like I just mentioned before, from a bodily standpoint, wh- what is my physical vessel? What are the feelings going on in my physical vessel? What, right? But then yeah. also, but then also like the brokenness of my heart, the trauma I haven't healed from, the resistance and misalignment that I find myself in, in this broken world. I can see it. I feel like the lights turn on when I get into my breath. Yeah. I can I I I feel like I can I can identify the things that are going on internally and externally. Yes. I root myself in the breath. It's a complete dynamic shift. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I and I I I just <laughs> I thank you as 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 a brother on this journey for enlightening me to that because it has had a transformational um difference in how I've uh, how I've approached life and also it's just it's been a therapeutic relief <laughs> mm-hmm. for uh, yeah. for my own for my own processing as someone who who struggles with uh with anxiety so I so I thank you brother for that yeah of course 
Um, I did, there was some energy coming to me as you were saying that, if you want me to uh, sure. translate what that is. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think, you know, like I uh, just let it come through me. You know, when I'm interacting with people, I can feel the energy. And I said this, and I want to make it clear again for people that are listening in case they're curious, like, what do I do? And other people do this as well. And when I can feel it coming through, then I just give it the space and it comes out. And that's what meditation is. But you're doing it for yourself. But once you do it long enough, you realize how, like I said, you're being asked for from other people to do the same. And everyone's doing that mostly or somewhat <laughs> in different ways. But like I said, when you go into the, like, the real nuanced subtlety of it, you're aware that everything is energy and you're aware of what is coming through you and for the purposes. So as you were saying that, I could feel it. It was on my left side, which is more the feminine. Um, but what 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 it really is, um, is that this is the best way to say it for anybody that's listening or you. What we see in the world is what's still within us. Mm -hmm. And I told this to you on the phone the other day. It's like, our perception of reality, even in our closest relationships, partnerships, life partnerships, soulmates, we're still only overlapping. It's never a full um, yes. perceptual experience that is identical. Otherwise, yes. we'd be the same person. And what we see in the world is what is still within us that we are shifting within ourselves um, energetically. And as we do that, those people and things will come to us and we'll recognize them for what we had already done in ourselves and then we are helping those people to shift which then so goes so on and so forth to each subsequent person that they come in contact with so the world doesn't change by coercion or assertion or government policy any of these things it changes by the individual yes because when they truly see that they are everything then they understand that all they have to change is themselves Yes. Because as they do, they won't even see those things anymore. Or if they do, they don't even see them the same way. Because it seems so intense when you're in those states. Like, oh my gosh, there's this thing wrong. And you had mentioned it in some of your commentary. Like, what's going on with the world and this and that. But if you hear me speak in the beginning, I was telling you that this is the best time ever. Because we are collectively coming into harmony. But it doesn't seem like that if the person hasn't done that within themselves yet. Yes. Yes. I totally agree. Um, yeah. So also another thing I wanted to talk about was sobriety. So I am currently for the most part living a pretty sober lifestyle. Um, I will occasionally like socially drink, but to be honest, I'm craving it less and less. And I, yeah, I'm really just trying to prioritize my health. So I was curious, Jeffrey, if you could talk more about how you, you've mentioned that sobriety is a big part of your life. And I I just want to bring a discussion about uh, the benefits of being sober and how it's actually good for us as human beings. And um, yeah, and, and, and just how that's helped you in your life. And um, yeah, so if you have anything to say. Sure. About um, okay, so I was never addicted to anything. So I'm not like when, when I refer to as sobriety, that's not really an experience for me because that's just my default, you know, like the amount of substances that I've used have always been very intentional. They've never controlled me. Um, so like, for example, in college, when I had friends that wanted to drink, I would do it periodically. But then for the most part, I would, if like we were playing beer pong or something, it's a long time ago, they would drink for me because they wanted me to play so bad. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not drinking. So I would drink so seldomly as far as alcohol is concerned. Other substances like plant medicines and whatnot, I never really dabbled in anything except for cannabis. And that was when I was younger. Um, I was in the medical system for years and the doctors told me that I was going to be on certain medications my whole life. And all kinds of stuff, but I knew intuitively that wasn't true. So I had two major periods in my life where I was healing my karma, which I came in with a lot. The more karma one has, the more of an awareness they have. Not everybody is going to have the same level of awareness, conscious awareness. Everybody has a different path in this life. And, and, and just, just but the more karma we have, go ahead. 
to clarify this karma are you speaking about negative karma or positive karma like what 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 do you let me redefine that let me redefine that i almost don't even use that word a lot yeah um, and i had somebody in town a couple of weeks ago when we were having this exact conversation i was having this with her and karma gets confused but what it means is it's it's just our mind it's like what we believe and perceive reality to be and that could be from previous lifetimes or this lifetime it's just limitations and that's all it really is. So it's more of like a conditional mind. So, you know, what I experienced when I was younger was not necessarily my conditioning for me that I came in, like, I want to believe that, but it was something that I came in knowing that I was going to shift for others and myself. So I didn't know when I was five years old that I was going to be sick and they were going to put me on these medications. It was going to make something else happen and something else in this continual you know, train or cascade of events. I was, you know, but it was obviously part of my path. And by the time I was 10 or 11, or I think actually 12, I realized these things don't work. Like I am whole already. I'm healthy. I just need to get out of all of these things. And so I quit taking those medications without telling anybody. And then within a month or two, I was completely healed mm -hmm. and they were bewildered. These were specialists all over Dallas, you know, nine plus specialists. And they what couldn't the understand condition? what was the condition that you had i don't think it really uh, i mean it's not it's a light and i mentioned this to you on the phone it does it's not it's just a term yeah it could, it could be there are different doctors if someone if someone also has well, let, well, well let me say it this way this will be more helpful but to be general and okay. I, I can tell you this will be general because each doctor and each specialist had a different way of categorizing it okay because and this this is the reason it's important to keep it broad is because words are just labels and even the words that we use to communicate right now will mean something different later meaning if you personally were to listen to this podcast in a year from now you would even hear what i'm saying now differently than what you're hearing it now and so when we use certain words that have a big meaning to them collectively that we've assigned to it then we get stuck in what that means to us could you and use the point general, that i'm trying to could you use a general field of terms like was this with mental health was this with your cardiovascular health was this with your um everything okay everything it was physical it was mental um i mean it was everything and yeah. everything was affected so it's because and I, and I don't want to push against anything because it's all part of our collective path um, you know, when you try to treat something from the physical, you're never going to treat it. It's, it's a spiritual yeah. thing, but you mentioned this in the beginning, spiritual brokenness from spiritual, nothing's broken. It's the physical layers at top of that, that is not even broken, but fractured or a better word would be even perhaps, um, refracted or not clear. Mm -hmm. So from the spiritual, everything is clear. But our mind and our conditioning and our karma is what causes the refractions that cause the confusion. And that's what we have to purify to mm -hmm. be able to see it clearly. And so anyways, those were terms. And, you know, as I said, intuitively, I knew and then I was healed. But it did take me probably another three years to fully heal. It just means within a month, I didn't need anything and I was better. And it took probably another two years before I was like fully functioning, like I probably should have been because I was on medications from, you know, the time I was eight years old. Yeah. And um, I will say this at that time, nobody was eating organic. Nobody even really knew what organic was, but I intuitively was being called to organic. What is organic? And there was mean? at that time. Huh? What does organic mean? Organic in the sense that it's not modified. The food's not modified. It's not treated with anything. I mean, now organic is, is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Yeah, You know, everybody knows what Whole Foods is and, you know, most people try to steer towards organic and whatnot. But at that time, we're talking like in the 90s, Yeah, people were like, what are you talking about? Everything is organic. Yeah. And when I would explain it to them, it was they were baffled. There was literally only two Whole Foods in all of Dallas and I think three in all of Texas. They started in Austin and I had to drive like 30 minutes to go to get my food every day. And people thought I was nuts in high school. They're like, what are you doing? You're so difficult. Of course, then 15 years later, those same people then went through what I did in a different way. Yeah. But it's like I said, we all have a path that we come into to help others understand. Right. And, you just and so I chose that path. 
Yeah, you just yeah. Just so I just chose that. Yeah. Yeah. So then that segued into the same thing that happened in my twenties, which was you know this event where I had to heal from it and then learn how to truly connect with spirit and then see that we are all one and that we are helping each other recognize that oneness through our own individual lens. Because what I really saw is that humanity and future iterations is far beyond what we have been living for pretty much all that we can remember. <laughs> like yeah. we are so limited right now. We're so limited, but what we will become is beyond what most, most people can fathom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's part of my purpose of sharing all of this because if people can find it individually, it spreads so quickly Yeah. because people want to know like, how are you doing that? And how do you look this way or feel this way or behave that way? Yeah. And when people What's ask, that? that means they're ready to hear. But until they ask, they're not ready to hear. Exactly. Yeah, it's that openness and longingness rooted in humility to grow, realizing we don't know all the answers. Yeah. Trusting and trusting someone else's path, you know, um, yeah. that's that's how we can be enlightened on our own. For sure. So I wanted to make a one more remark because it wasn't full about, you know, sobriety or substances. Um, there's nothing wrong with anything. Like inherently, there's nothing wrong. There's a balance with everything. I mean, sugar or food or water or even exercise can be distractions, essentially. And substances can be distractions, even beneficial ones or even herbs that are used for certain purposes. When we think we need those things, that's when they become uh, the, the we give our power away. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use things. It's just, it should be, you know, in a way in which we feel like intuitively it's needed or it's used intentionally for something to rebalance because everything is within us. Everything outside is a projection of us. And sure, somebody could sit and meditate and bring everything to themselves. I've actually done that. It's not fun though. So it's a balance of blending our external reality with our internal and so, you know, when most of my life when I was younger, it was all, all outside. And then it was for a year, all inside. And then it was a blend. And then I was understanding like, where does that blend? And what do, what do I want to experience in that blend? And, you know, if we use something, we feel like we have to have something, then we're always going to have to have that thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, when it comes to substances like alcohol, especially, then it will become a hindering factor because we're never going to be feeling source. God, whatever, which is in communion with us all day. But if something happens, we don't understand it and we don't want to feel it. The feeling is happening to teach us. And most people don't want to sit with the feeling and learn what that feeling is telling them, which can shift it instantly. But what's crazy is any instance uh, that something is happening to create that feeling, if somebody is to understand it as quickly as they allow it, the thing that they thought that they didn't want that created that feeling will change almost instantly, but people don't know that. And so they delay it for years sometimes and decades. And then when we use something, then we, we delay it too, or then we think we need that thing to understand it. So even plant medicines, which can be beneficial if somebody has a lot of resistance and there's a lot of clearing that needs to be done, or they need to interact with spirit in a different way, then you know people will get caught up in those things as well. Uh, you know, in a different way. But like I said, it could be food. It could be exercise. I mean, it could even be too much meditation, even, you know, like, you know, I'm extreme and I didn't need to do all that, but I experienced things in that period of time. And, you know, I talked on the phone about this that were beyond physical, you know, like I've never done plant medicines and they were similar to what some people that I've known that do them or shamans have expressed and those experiences so you don't need those things to have those experiences but it takes more yeah. time to get there yeah i think point I think, being is there's nothing ever going wrong it's just always knowing that we're on our path and we're we're just trying to find better flow with it yeah so. I, I think one, one of the beautiful things that we talked about previously about your walk and being sober is that you don't need to do psychedelic drugs to experience ego death you don't need to be under the substance of any sort of plant medicine or any sort of medicine really to achieve plant a state to, to achieve a state of enlightenment or love or deeper consciousness. These tools are all available to us 
and there are natural methods for us to access them. So I think I think that that's important and needs to be uh, needs to be said. Another thing I wanted. Sorry, to- yeah, I, I like I said, I'm not, and I want to make it clear that no, nothing. There's nothing wrong with anything if it feels somebody's called to it and it's part of their path. But the truth is, they aren't necessary too at the same time. So just yeah. to know that, I, yeah. I think is what's important. So yeah, yeah. So okay. So another thing I want to talk to you about Jeffrey was your thoughts on Christianity, on Jesus, on the Bible, all of these different things. We live in a very religiousized world in uh, in the United States and also Texas, very Christian dominant. And I would love to hear your, your take on Jesus. I know that's very broad. Uh, you kind of look like representations of Jesus uh, in the way that America has portrayed him even though he was a Middle Eastern brown guy, uh, but would love to hear your take on, on Jesus, what Jesus means to you, what your what your opinion on, on Christianity is, and, and you can kind of take this any way that you feel called. Mm, there was That was the most energy that you've summoned through me yet. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's Jesus. It's not so, me. <laughs> yeah. But just to explain what the experience is like for me, if, if anyone is interested, um, it's energy that goes up through my channels in my body. And, you know, uh, Eastern or yoga tradition will say it's like nadis and different types of channels, but it, it swirls through my body and it'll resonate in different areas. But what you were just doing there was coming through my whole body all the way up to my crown. And what you were asking before was just on my left side, which is predominantly feminine. So what you were just asking was everything in my, in my essence. So, wow. And it, this is why I like doing this because when I'm, when I'm doing this work with people, I'm just a conduit for energy, you know, and so I'm re- I'm receiving and flowing energy. I'm not having to push energy. I'm not having to pull energy. It's just flowing, and so I'm almost like meditating essentially while yeah. interacting no and giving. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, um, great question. I'll have to share um, my experience, and uh, this might I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, you know, when I was younger. I grew up where everyone I knew was religious, Christian, and but it didn't resonate with me. And I would tell people like I'm spiritual and we're talking like five, six years old. I would go to like Bible school and some stuff. And it was always yeah. like tell, tell very them, negative. Tell, tell them what you told me when you were three, what you told your mom. I thought that was a funny story. Um, which one? I, I mean, I said a lot to her when I was three, but I think the first, like I was always introspective and in, in inquiring about life. Yeah. And I think when I was like three or four, I was sitting, I remember very vividly sitting in her lap. It's probably four. I was sitting in her lap and uh, I was like, I don't want to die. And uh, she was like, what do you mean? And then I started asking her like, well, you know, what is life? And we were talking, I started getting into Christianity and I was asking questions about like, what if people don't know, Jesus. you know, what if they don't find this and how, what's that? And nobody. And so then that started this whole progression for years of like questions that I had. And I would ask pastors and people that were very religious and, None of these people had answers for me. And I was like, what the heck? So I felt like for most of my adolescence that I was like literally the only person in the world that didn't understand, you know, but yet I didn't want to just say I did. I couldn't say that. It didn't feel right in my essence and my soul. And, but then finally, as I started to progress and all those things were happening simultaneously, like with illness and stuff, but then as I started to heal and connect with that truth within me, then those things started to shift and then the world started to represent that and show that to me and other people that were, you know, somewhat more connected or at least understood themselves in certain ways. And it was like in hindsight, they were awakened people or at least on their path to that. And so then what was interesting about, you know, religion, it's like once I got to probably in my twenties, I was having these conversations with people that were, just normal at that point about life and, you know, religion too. And it was still coming up in my experience. But once I got past that about five years ago, rarely do I have people come to me about religion. Rarely. Like this is the first time I've been asked that probably in four years. That's because it's still something within you a little bit. Um, But my experience started um, when I started to see the truth of everything, when I was meditating all the time. And you can just feel truth. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. Nine years ago or 10 years ago, when I first started doing yoga, I had taken like one class before that wreck. 
But then, and it opened me up so much to that period. I didn't even realize it. But then after the wreck, when I first started doing yoga on my own, I started to have visions that would just come to me. And I talked about this on the phone with you a little bit, but these visions were not visions that you can perceive in our current physical reality because we're perceiving 3d in a two-dimensional plane we're not really seeing much but what i would receive was these these visions that were um if i could interpret it maybe like geometrical i said um but but it's like time i thought people, I thought people describe dmt by the way <laughs> so you're yeah. having this totally sober but continue yeah just doing yoga like just holding poses and yeah. stuff and it would be like um almost like you could see the shapes and the the patterns in time but at once so it was like but but at the same time i could sense what it meant at this as well so it was like energetic patterns that i was perceiving in my third eye or visually but also feeling in my essence in my body and my consciousness and then what would happen is it would play out in my life like for the next week or two or whatever and I couldn't really explain that even to myself at that time, 10 years ago. But then as I started to meditate more, you know, four or five years later, it would happen more frequently. And then I would understand it because my awareness beyond all of it was able to kind of like see it and just see the patterns of it. And it would just be like information, basically, like downloads, like, oh, here's what's coming next. And then it would play out in physical life. And what was interesting is then um, I started to... Um, what it pertains to Jesus in particular, this is where it gets real interesting. It was probably 2020. Um, so at that point, I already understood, like all these teachers in the past were teaching their unique experience, like what they knew about God or source. But most people, you know, anyone, no one can hear anything the same way. Even if a thousand or a hundred million people listen to this exact thing, they would all interpret it a different way. Yeah, And even if they went back and listened to it a year later, they would still interpret it different then. It's all relative to time and consciousness and awareness at the moment. And that's what all these teachers were doing. But it got interpreted in different ways. Then people tried to create something around it and some kind of framework, and it gets misinterpreted over time. And if you can imagine, even 2,000 years, that's tremendous amounts of time. A lot of time. And collectively, we've all shifted. Different languages. Yeah. So, But what's interesting about Jesus in particular and all of my meditations, I had some crazy experiences where I would be outside of, um, you know, my body and I'd be in the universe and I'd be outside of time and, you know, some awesome, awesome experiences that just were incredible. But they started that way and they started to become more relevant. And the last one that I had in 2020, I think it was, was um, I'd never been anybody. I'd never experienced people. It was always like patterns or geometric mm -hmm. or um or um you know like like universal cosmic stuff and then 2020 i was transported into jesus and the reason i knew it was because as soon i was in that experience the feeling of it feeling is truth and most people confuse their emotions because they don't understand their emotions but there's a separation between a sensation or a feeling and an emotion. Like it's very, it's very discreet. Um, but the feeling was unconditional love. The mm -hmm. feeling was something I had never experienced ever, but it was pure source love. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it was, was God. Meditation? Yes. Yes. It was God embodied in physical form. That's what my experience was. And I knew as soon as I was having that experience, what it was, even though I was embodied as Jesus and I wasn't seeing myself, as soon as I was in that experience, I knew it was instant. And what the, it was a very brief experience. I was walking uh, towards a body of water that looked like a, a lake, but life did not look like it does now. Like everything was alive, like the trees. I mean, it looked the same way, but it was way more vibrant. Like, yeah. and everybody could just sense that everything was alive and everything was one. Everything was consciousness yeah. and source or God. And the trees, the ground, even the dirt, the, 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 uh, the wood buildings, like houses were all vibrant and living and alive and treated that way. Mm -hmm. And these kids were running up to me and wanting to hold my hand and we were walking towards this village and there was this big body of water and the water looked like it was its own consciousness and alive 
And all of it was so incredibly beautiful. But for me, what the experience showed me was unconditional love. Unconditional love, which is God, which is source. But it showed me how to embody it. If I didn't have that experience and that meditation, I wouldn't have known what it really felt like to embody that. Yeah. And then once you have an experience, that's the only thing that we can ever understand. Not words, not books, not gurus, only our own experience. And so that experience showed me that and then i knew for sure what i had already cerebrally or intellectually known uh which is that we're all here to find that relationship with god or unconditional love and that's the whole point of being human in this physical form in this time and space because we're eternal beings and this life is about that reconnection with God, with source. But most people confuse what that really means. And they're trying to follow all these rules and yep. books and texts and people. It's You don't need any of that. Anybody could go sit with themselves for a period of time and find it and yep. know what it truly means. Yeah, And then they would naturally express it through their path that they are intended to have. Yeah. So, do, yeah. So do you believe Jesus is God incarnate? Like Jesus is God? Everybody is. Mm. everybody is but wouldn't wouldn't you say that we have sin within ourselves and jesus was man without sin no what, what, what's your take on it sin is the same as karma and that is um conditioning beliefs like if we think we're just this one human then we're already conditioned to believe that we are limited but if we believe or if we can see that we are everyone, there's no separation. There's only one source. There's only one source. There's only one source. Whether you call it God, universe, there's only one source. So anything that is an expression of that is an extension of that in a unique way. And so Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, these are all different variations of that to show people what they needed to know to understand how to find that within them and so let's just say jesus had no sin okay Mm -hmm. well then he had no conditioning then he had no karma so then that would be the situation but ultimately what he was becoming was the same thing that we are all becoming and if he had if he was purely connected at all times and his his and I won't go to the depth of this because this is not my place to say this. Then someone has to believe how much what their path is. Like, why was he then crucified? You know, like what were those things? But I don't want to get into that because the whole point is then we start getting into the history. And the history isn't that relevant. It's the message. It's the message that's relevant. Yeah, the narrative. And if if somebody, if you start getting into interpretation, then so you're losing the point. And that is that it's within. That it's within. And and I'll say this from my own personal experience. Whenever I'm in pursuit of something, I can tell when it's no longer resonant within me. And I only know that by how deeply I continue to connect with it within me. But if I was always going outside and asking for, even if it was my soulmate or if it's my, you know, whomever, or book or guru, you're always going to that person instead of finding it within. Yeah. That's the whole point. Because when we're truly whole on our own, then our life is continuously unfolding to give us a little bit more awareness of ourself there's no end to it there's no end to it even if i was to go meditate again for another year for 15 hours i would still be evolving even after that coming out of that even if i had more clarity yeah because there's no end to our evolution if there was an end then we wouldn't be we wouldn't be eternal we wouldn't exist to begin with yeah there is no beginning there is no end there no human no life form will ever see that that's that's the point because we are here to continuously evolve in a linear or perceived linear way it's not really linear but it's perceived that way so that we can have this experience because the experience is the point it should be joyous it should be fun 
Yeah. And this isn't, it's not serious. This is all, this is all just for understanding, yeah. but it should be fun. And it should be, it should be fun to talk about and understand. But, you know, last thing I'll say about it is it's, it gets serious sometimes um, when people are confused. Yeah. And when they're confused, they don't want to be confused. And so things become more serious. And it's like, I got to understand this and I don't want that to happen again. And, you know, all that. And like I said, the deeper someone's conditioning or karma is, the more awareness they will have. Um, mm. But it's important to understand that like joy and love and, you know, uh, happiness and all that is the point. So if it's not fun to do or to share, then share another way. Do you, you know, read, do you read the ahead. Bible at all? Like as, as a uh, text to help you experience God? No. So what's funny, here's, here's two things. that's interesting. My previous partner, uh, we were together for a while when I was doing all that yoga and meditation, she had been teaching yoga for 15 years. And when I was having that, she was the only person I was really talking to at that time. And if it wasn't for me being able to talk to her about some of the experiences, I probably wouldn't have kept doing it because it was so extreme. Yeah. It, it was like I was having experiences that I never heard of before. And I didn't understand it completely. But when I would talk to her about it, she would relate it to her background in yogic philosophy. And it would make sense because she was like, yeah, that's like this. And, and I would, you know, I would, I would, I would draw those two things and be like, okay, this isn't just some random experience I'm having. This is related to other stuff that people have taught and been around for thousands of years. And then, um, somebody that's in my life now, um, she actually, her and I have a podcast. Um, she read the Bible twice and we've talked a lot. I've talked to her more than anybody I've ever talked to about our spirituality uh individually and collectively both of ours and the overlap of our experiences are so fine and subtle it's impossible to describe them but her and i have talked a lot about the bible because she's read it twice and related to my own experiences and it's the same thing and so you know the bible can be a guidebook but it's still to the self it's always the self Everything is happening within us. Also, here, here, let me let me provide this analogy. You know, we are all one. If people haven't experienced that, they haven't experienced that. But everything that has happened within any person has happened with every within every person. Doesn't matter the time. Doesn't matter ten thousand years ago, ten thousand years from now. Does that make sense? Yes, the interconnectedness of the universe. But what does that mean? It means you don't have to know everything outside. You don't have to know all the stories of everything inside or outside. You only have to know it within you. And then when you know it within you, nothing you ever experience is confusing because you can see the truth in every single thing. Yeah. That's something that is very concise, but when it's yes. experienced, it's different. <laughs> So. It's very interesting to hear you talk about Jesus in this way because it's extremely nuanced. It's 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 extremely open to flow, whereas a lot of Christianity seems to be very rigid, very, very, very rigid, so much so that it's rigid among different sects and churches and, and takes. And, and, uh, and why do you think that is? control and power i would say but but wait let me ask you this and let's be can, we can get to the heart of this real quick what is control and power i think it's the ego preservation and what is ego the self one one word self you, you said it preservation and so what is preservation what does that come from insecurity okay you're getting there it's close Fear. Fear, yeah. And so is fear come from the heart? No, yeah. Fear and love are the are are the are the opposition forces in this because it's the only two things that exist. Yeah, it's fear. It's all it's all fear and love. And I've talked about this on previous episodes of 
we have a innate animalistic fear of like, I'm, I'm afraid of that giant lion that's in the room where I'm afraid of this person who's much larger than me. But then there's a, an entire sort of spiritual fear that's very, very deep and real. It has nothing to do with our physical bodies. It's just interesting. It's, it's very interesting to me to, to look at the interplay between physical mammalian life and then spiritual existential out of body life and how we we have like senses of both like we're 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 spiritual beings in this human experience so we have pulses on both of these things they're going on all the time you know we could like lean into our our flesh and our animal side or we can lean into our spirit it's just interesting that's well said there is a balance as i said too um and you know a lot of people will say that we're our spirit is evolving uh, simultaneously with our physical and uh, you know what i would say it's layers it's layers because you know us individually um outside of physical are so much more than just this and it's hard for us to interpret and if we were to try it would be overwhelming and it's not really related to um to this life we don't really need to know all that like anyone can have as deep of a spiritual experience as they want and they can use plant medicines and go as far as they, you know, want, but how relative is that to the human experience? There's a reason we're here in human experience and it is just to develop that connection with God, which is connection with self, which is unconditional love. Yes. And then how that plays out in our personal human life is, should be beautiful. All of it, whether it's a bit of sadness for a moment or a bit of, um, joy it has to be the spectrum but then we're not perceiving that spectrum the same anymore we're not taking that spectrum personally and we're learning how to mold it so to speak and choose more of what we want in that spectrum and then that spectrum becomes more nuanced instead of these extremes it's like very acute but because we're so much more subtly aware of it those things we still feel and sense but then our life doesn't have to be so extreme and where we are in that in that spectrum, meaning like if someone's in a big place of fear a lot, they're going to have these fearful experiences come around them. Yeah, if they're in pre them. predominantly in, in um, unconditional love, they're going to have those experiences. And it doesn't mean they're only going to be here, or only going to be here, but you predominantly want to be here. And then you're just kind of moving this a little bit, but it's relative. So now this slight movement here is equivalent to what used to be experienced, say, you know, previously in someone's life that was way up more. Yes, down the spectrum. yes, I, I, yes, I totally agree. That is, that is very on point insight. I, I think honestly, Jeffrey, like the, the ultimatum that a lot of Christians deliver of saying, if you believe in Jesus, then you'll be saved eternally and you'll receive salvation. And they kind that's of, their own fear. That's yeah, their they, own fear. They, because hold, they, don't they hold this decision to your head, like a gun to your head and saying, do you, do you accept Jesus or not? And if you don't, you're going to eternal hell. I think, I think though, I think from what you've said, I think you do accept Jesus as your savior. Like you are accepting this gift of unconditional love that is offered to us by God, the father. So I, I think from from even from their classic standpoint, you would you would you would receive salvation as well. Hell is here. Heaven is here. It doesn't matter if it's physical or non-physical. The experience is now. Because I've experienced both. Here. Mm -hmm. And so these are teachers that are teaching us the salvation is within ourselves. And so we can ask these teachers to show us something that we're wanting to know, right? And so for me, Jesus, what it means to me is so personal because of my experience that I had, that I could have never had in any kind of church or person or religion. It was, it was nothing outside of me. Nobody could have ever told me any stories. I could have never gone to church for years to have the experience. It came from me within myself. And before that, like I said, I never experienced an individual person. But I experienced him in me. And I knew that all was within me before that, but I especially saw that in that moment and felt that in that moment. 
And so if I would have been going to church my whole life and it would have all been like, you know, do this or that or fear and whatever, I would have always been in that state of fear that I had to do something. But when I experienced Jesus, I didn't do anything. Yeah. I just, I was, what I was doing for so long, just clearing my mind, karma, conditioning, sin, what everyone wants to call it, and allowing it to come in. And then I knew whatever was coming in was pure because I was coming in without any conditioning and how it felt. And so to have that personal experience with what that embodiment is, is my experience with God, source, unconditional love. And so however it physically expresses, doesn't matter. Why does, why is, like you said, why is there so many different interpretations of Jesus physically? No one really knows. No one really knows what that embodiment is. But the embodiment doesn't matter. It's the consciousness. It's the love. It's a melding of both. If you look at a lot of Eastern philosophy, it's more mind. If you look at Western Christianity, it's more heart. It's both. You can create from the mind, and people can manifest whatever they want from the mind, but there's no heart in it. Then it's not really a path. It's just to see what the power of the mind and consciousness can express. But if somebody can feel the heart and the passion and the love and the condition of it, and then they can sense that everybody is them, and they can feel that everybody is them, and they can see that, then there's no fear. Because even the person who's the most disconnected that comes into your life, you're not fearing them because you know that was in you at some point. And that you know how to be compassionate to that person to dissolve that fear that they have that you formerly used to have. So if anyone is ever telling anybody, this is what it is, and this is what you have to do, they're still in fear. Yeah. I never tell anybody what to do. Even when I teach people, I don't tell them what to do. I give them suggestions and I say, but you find it. Yeah. I never say this is one definitive thing. I say, here's my experiences and here are tools. Tools. Yoga is a tool. Meditation is a tool. Prayer is a tool. Breath is a tool. It's not what you have to do. Yeah. But there are certain universal things that are still always evolving. There's not one perfect breath technique. It's a continual evolution of love. Yep. That's what everything is. Absolutely. It's really simple. It is it is simple. It is simple. That's that is the beautiful thing. It really is simple. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. You know, it's funny. I'll say one more thing about Jesus. I was on this TV show uh, nine years ago with Bear Grylls. Uh, he's like a survivalist. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but it was right after I was in that wreck. And I was like, I want to do something. And I asked the universe, God, you know, like, give me something. I was in this place for three months, you know, where I couldn't do anything. And then I had these people reach out to me because I was going to be on Survivor and uh, like some dating shows and The Bachelor, like before all that. And so I knew these casting people. And so they reached out and like, hey, we saw you're in this situation. Would you want to be on this show with Bear Grylls? So I went and I did it. And it was amazing. It got me out of, you know, that situation. And I just got out of my wheelchair, like not even a week before. I didn't tell anybody that, but I just knew I'm going to do this. I don't care. My mind, that's how powerful our mind is. Our body will our body will do what our consciousness uh, is. Um, and that's proof of it. And I'll talk about that later on if we have time with yoga and everything else. But when we were done filming the show, we were flying back to Auckland from Christ Church. Um, I can't remember. And Bear got on the plane. He's like, you look like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a big religious person. You know, he's a big Christian. And I had people say that to me uh, many times in the last like seven years periodically, but it's because I believe, like I said, that it's all within us. And my expression for me personally has been unconditional love for most of my life. And I would just get lost sometimes because I always loved everything to extreme degree. And so I think it's just that it, it, people can see that in me at times. And so then they interpret it physically in some way, which is what Jesus was embodying. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting that you said that at the beginning of this that's a, yeah that's a great story jeffrey you mentioned several times through our talk today that yeah. we that we are all one and i think that's something that a lot of people will say spiritual people will say but for yeah. but for a lot of people i think their first thought is no we're not you're over there. 
I'm over here. I don't think your thoughts, you don't think my thoughts, I can't control your actions. I can control my actions. We are not all one. <laughs> we are very separate. And if you look at a lot of what's going on in the media with government, <laughs> you're Democrat, I'm Republican. You are this, I'm that. It's it's divisive, it's division. It's it's not interconnectedness, it's not unity. And I think mm. I think the vibe of the society and culture is we are anything but one. So a lot of people may have a hard time agreeing, understanding with this concept of the death of the ego, of us all being one. Could you just bring some insight into and clarity into how we are all one? Hmm. Good movement of energy. Um, you can't, you can't just know it. Words don't teach, but what happens when we share stories and experiences, it provides a resonance for people to feel. So words are cumbersome. They're not even really parlaying the essence of what we're doing. Um, if I was to sit with you in meditation, I could convey to you just as much as if we were to talk for an hour. And words are placeholders for energy. But when I say things or when anybody hears things, they are attracting that into their experience. So if we're getting into the laws of the universe, like law of attraction and all these other things, when somebody hears something, it's because they're asking to hear that in some way for some clarity. And not everything is going to be in resonance at every any given moment because people are at different places. But if people have heard these things, they've heard it for a reason. And whatever they could hear from it at the time is what they needed, but at least it was something there that was planted. And there's seeds that are planted all the time in each of us that we're asking for, but we're not always consciously planting those seeds. And before we're kind of awake or enlightened or whatever everyone wants to call it, we're just kind of unconsciously receiving the inputs that our source or spirit or soul or whatever is guiding us to. And until we're aware of how those things are coming to our experience, we just think everything's random. And it seems like everything's random. When I was, you know, younger and I was going through all that stuff, I was very much kind of like a scientific person. I just believed everything could be explained through science and logic and rationality. And um, I would still say I was spiritual. I was like, I'm the spiritual person on the spiritual journey. Um, and then when I had all those experiences for the last decade, you know, it's like the exact opposite. Like I said, I know why everything is happening in my life and I'm doing it. I'm doing it. If I'm, no matter how I'm living, I'm doing it. But most people don't know how they're doing it and they want to give that power away. And it's because they don't like something. So they think, well, I wouldn't do that. So that's not me. That's something else. And so they assign that to something that's negative or outside of them. And so to do that means that there's something positive outside of them as well. But then when you realize that duality exists within you, feminine and masculine exists within you, and I won't get into the details of why this expresses differently in people and transgender and all that, none of that is wrong. It's just a balance of those two energies within each individual person, no matter how they're expressing physically. But to know how that is connected to each of us, you have to first see those things within you. And then here's the kind of nuance of it. When you realize that everything is coming to you because of what you're doing, your life has never lived the same way. You're never trying to do anything. You're always just trying to fine tune your awareness because you realize that it's coming to you by your awareness, not by what you're doing. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. And the universe, God, source, whatever, will bring you that deeper understanding or awareness. But if you're in fear, and you don't like something, then that's your ego, not allowing you to receive what it is that your source or spirit or soul is giving to you. And most people will push those things away all of their life. But somebody has to receive those experiences to start seeing and feeling and understanding the wholeness that it is all one, that we are all one expressing in these individual physical iterations. But there's layers there's layers in between the source. It's not just source human. There's a spirit, there's a soul. Like there's all these layers of us that go eventually to the source. 
-hmm. there's not two sources there's not two gods it's one god refracted in trillions and incomprehensible numbers to get to us but you can communicate with other people you can affect other people through your mind and through your heart i've done this for years i've had people say things to me that i wanted them to say like exact words exact phrases i've affected the weather like we can do a lot but we're so accustomed to being in the physical that we think we have to manipulate the physical but that's the lowest level of of awareness the lowest level of consciousness to think that we have to affect the physical to make changes in the physical that's not where it happens but like i said people have to experience it to know it i can tell stories and i can give stuff but it doesn't mean much what it really matters is that people have some way of allowing themselves to evolve but most people aren't really evolving they think they are because their life's changing a little bit but they're not really evolving yeah i i, I think that's the the mood of this whole talk has kind of been you you find your answers yourself i think that that's been the 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 essence of a lot of this i i wanted well, to ask, let me let me say a caveat right though people are those answers too so for example if you ask god i'll say god show me blank or help me understand blank then people are going to come in to be those answers too we don't just go sit in the mountains. We can. I almost essentially did that in 2018. But the universe, God will bring you those things too that are those answers. Hmm. But most of the time when those answers come in, if it doesn't fit at low levels of consciousness, if it doesn't fit within the paradigm that they currently exist in and it scares them, they push it away, even though it's coming to them all the time. If anyone is ever pushing something away, it's because there's something they're supposed to understand from it but they're not allowing it to, even though they're asking and they don't realize that's the answer. That's the answer to what they're asking for. And they'll ask forever for years and they don't let it in. Yeah. I, I'd love to ask you, I know you're on your path to enlightenment and you mentioned before this concept of duality between light and darkness and jeffrey i i'd love for you to just talk more about the darkness that you've found present within yourself it goes back to the terms like i refer to it as feminine and masculine because it's just two energies it's just two energies and if people look at it as light and dark then they interpret dark as something negative but if you look at it in a different way and you look at it as feminine and masculine it changes the concept in the mind but and the paradigm any the any, any sort of negativity within yourself do, do you experience that still you must right like any sort any sort of like negativity well, what would you define as define negativity and so when you feel ne you're, you're very aware now you're very spiritually aware now but you you can still experience fear you can still experience negativity you can still still experience low vibration so i'm just i'm just curious if you could talk about the and, and struggles like the struggles that you've had like you know what i'm saying like if you could give some some context into all all of yeah. that well, negativity that you've experienced still even being in this state of awareness and the path and seeking love and all these great things that you've you've highlighted you you're you're still a human being you still struggle you're still yeah. imperfect so could you could you talk more about that i'll say it from you know perspective that'll be different than kind of what you're asking but from my personal experience um like, for example, I'll say this. When I come into presence with somebody, I, their energy is within me. And then it'll express. So if I'm not doing this like I am with you, and I come into contact with somebody, that energy will come through me in some way, and I have to express it. And it'll be clarifying, mm -hmm. even though it may have been something I already experienced. And so then, however I express it, and I put it out into the universe or into the world, it's for clarity for other people. When I get caught up in my own desires that are coming not balanced from heart and mind 
then that's when I struggle because I'm trying to make something happen. But what the point is, we don't have to make anything happen. If we have a desire, it means that it's already happened. But people are trying to make it happen because they want to define the path to it in some way because they think it needs to look a certain way because of their conditioning or karma or sin. That's what the balance is. So when I struggle, it means it's because I'm trying to make what I've already seen that's happening for me through a desire or vision. I'm trying to make it happen. And so when I try to make it happen, then I'm in resistance. And it doesn't mean it doesn't happen because it still does happen. It just means it happens at a lower timeline and a lower vibration. But what some people do is they stay in those way low dense timelines for long periods of time. And those things that they still want to happen will still happen even if it's 10 years later. But they're in such a low density experience that it moves so slow. The energy, if you think about waves at low densities are super long and slow. When you're in higher frequencies, it's so fast. That's why the synchronicity at higher experiences move so fast. The manifestations happen so fast. So it's very easy for me or anyone who's practicing these things to realize, oh, this is happening so slow. What am I trying to make happen? What do I have to let go of? It's always a letting go. It's never a doing. It's never a doing. The doing should always be from a place of pure passion and love and joy, not to make it happen. So if you're talking to somebody about a project or you're working on something and you feel like I have to do this, if it's truly not inspired, it doesn't mean it's not going to make it move forward. It's just it's moving forward in a very dense, slow way. And it's a struggle. It seems like a struggle, but it's fine because no matter what, all of the things that are on our heart are made to manifest. All of the things, yeah. all of them. So that's how God speaks to us. Okay. So, so you spoke before about, or we spoke before about fear and love being kind of at odds with one another, like love being good, fear being bad. Do you see fear having any beneficial purpose for us? They say in the Bible, oftentimes we are called to fear the Lord, fear God. Um, I was just curious what your take on that is. Fear would be, in my interpretation then, would be um, what we need to understand where we are, where we are, where we are existing. Are we, if we're fearful, you know, it's kind of like there's things that are playing out. So let me, let me say this real quick, and this will make more sense to answer it. Like when I was meditating a lot, I would go to the store. This is pre-corona, and I was hardly out in public because it was so intense, the energy. Like if I just went out in public, it was overwhelming because I could sense so much. It's impossible to describe what the experiences are like. Um, but I could see people, like energetically, I could feel them. And, and it, everybody was really dense and heavy and I could see their projections. It was just like crazy. And, um, but I could also sense this field, like this timeline of things playing out. Like I would sense somebody was about to trip and somebody would trip like 30 seconds later. <laughs> like there's there's this timeline of, of energy that is playing out. And so I was experiencing it in this really heightened way because my acuity was so sharp because of all I was doing was meditating basically. But we're all still tied into that too, in, in more subtle or less subtle ways. And so there are things that are going to play out that we've been contributing to. And so in a moment, if we feel like something's off, it's a difference in fear. It's not fear. It's, it's sensing. This is what I was talking about earlier about sensations. People confuse sensations and emotions and fear. and Like there's all these things that are kind of like grouped together, but people have never been able to separate them. And understand them and so fear if it's true fear not because of something like that's imminently happening that they can sense but it's a true fear if somebody can recognize it's because i don't understand or i don't like that then there is something for them to understand from it ah. but if it's but if they're sensing something that's right really like, oh there's you're saying that fear can be an indication of something that needs to be learned. That's, that's I think, really interesting. And here's, here's why. Because when I was in those places, especially when I had that Jesus meditation, for probably three months, all I could see was love. Nothing. I could see the perfection of everything. I could see the perfection of everything. I could not see fault in anything. 
And I knew it was all perfectly orchestrated as this play for people to have that understanding in themselves. So it'll never go away. Fear will never go away completely. Even in 500 years, no matter what future timelines or versions or iterations exist, it'll just be way more subtle, way more subtle. Like what we would experience now would be relatively so extreme. If somebody was to experience it from the future to now, they'd be like, well, that's crazy. I can't believe they were living that way. Yeah. Same as if we were to go back maybe 3000 years and be like, what? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a relative experience, but it's yeah. a guidance. It's a guidance yeah. of, of our own individual limitation that we fear. Yeah. We fear outside of us and then within us. My my take on it with fearing God is having a total respect and adoration for this higher being of unconditional love, like we talked about, right? To not, because when you fear something that has control over you, when you fear something, that thing that you're fearing, the reason you fear it is because in your mind, you're giving it priority you are subordinate to the thing that you fear and i think the only thing that we are really called to fear is the lord by basically saying that we are to be subordinate to this higher unconditional love and that's really the whole point of of life right is to flow within that that state of unconditional love so that is my take on the question but the last thing that i wanted to ask you about before we wrap up, is sex. <laughs> sex is something that we oftentimes don't talk about openly. It's taboo to talk about. It is, uh, it's a big part of our lives. It is literal, like, life creating. But I, I, I feel that it's something that, as a society, we, we, it's, it can be kind of amorphous and hard to, Hard to really grow in, know what's right, know how to experience it fully. And Jeffrey, you are a very introspective person and you've you've thought a lot about these concepts. So I would love for you, and once again, super open, you can talk about this however you like, however you feel comfortable, but I would mm -hmm. love for you to just give mm -hmm. some insight into sex, best practices, whatever it may be. Sure. Um you know, it's a, it's a blessing to be physical in our own being and to experience our own bodies. And a lot of people give that away. Like, you know, they, they don't really understand the, the, their true complexity of their bodies. And, you know, even in my yoga practice, the deeper I go, there's no end. There's no end to what you can experience in this body of self. And, um, you know, a lot of times people, um, you know, they're, they're experiencing their body in the most intense ways through that, through that experience, you know, whether it be with self or with another, because it's such an intense experience and there's a lot of energy flow uh, in that experience. And so there's so much I could say about it, but to, to understand the body of the self first, then you understand your connection of your body with somebody else. And, and deeper and deeper ways. And so the endlessness of the self-expression or understanding is the same endlessness of the expression understanding with another. And so if someone is doing that with themselves, meaning they are continuously going and delving deeper into their own physicality, and that's where a lot of spirituality misses. There's just more cerebral or even heart focus, but they really bypass the body. It's mind, body, spirit, which spirit to me speaks through heart, but also comes through both. And, you know, heart being an unconditional love. And so the body, um, you know, is often overlooked. But that's why yoga is such a powerful tool because consciousness is expressing in the body too. So if you're opening your body, you're also opening your mind. And if you're opening your mind, the body won't necessarily open, but it can. You can change your body. I'll sit in lotus periodically and I'll open my body just by sitting. But I had to be able to do it first in my body to be able to do that in the opposite or reverse. So as it pertains to you know, sexuality, or even expression with another, that anchoring of energy and each other is really intense in, in a moment. Like it's, it's happening in, you know, moments, you know, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's an hour or whatever it may be. 
but that level of connection or intimacy happens all the time with everybody. But the level in which we are open and connecting is often limited except for in those physical acts together. That's why when people are physically together, stuff blows up. Like all this stuff comes to the surface for both of them because it's the only time that they're really maybe even connecting with themselves yeah, or another. And so then all this stuff comes up and these relationship things come up and then it's like all this stuff to the surface. But when somebody understands themselves and they're connecting in these other ways that are intimate before the physical, then when that physical happens, it's a progression or if, if not similar to what's already been occurring between those two people. And I won't give specific details about my own personal experience, but I can say generally from my experiences that I have had experiences with people um, physically um, in that way that's, you know, connecting with another, you know, pretty quickly. But then also I have had deeper intimate experiences soulfully and spiritually um, before ever engaging in any kind of physical activity, um, even if it's uh, not sexual. And it's because of the soul connection or the connection between the two people and the intention. Because from my experience, there are people that we are intended to rendezvous with. Like there's a lot of people out there and we will rendezvous with different people. Some of them are, could be one person or another, but there are some specific people that that do come in that we knew we were going to have rendezvous with. For me, if I was to just, you know, be physical with people and not have that connection, then that energy would not be understood. And yeah. then it would be, it would be, um, I would be receiving a lot of their energy. Like I just said, I'll give you an example of my own personal experience. Most people don't even know this. If I interact with somebody, even this interaction, once we're done and I meditate later and stuff, there's going to stuff that's going to come through me as a result of our energy. And we're not even in person. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine people that are intimate and they don't really have a connection with themselves. And they don't really be the other person. Their energies are fueling each other um, in ways that they, they, they can't even interpret their own energy and their own self let alone what's coming through the other person. So there's nothing wrong with sex. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Have it's you ever just... felt guilt after having sex, like maybe like with a casual encounter or watching pornography or anything like that? Have you ever, or like maybe when you began the sexual journey, a lot of people feel guilt. Has that ever been a part of your story? I mean, that would have to be so long ago that, I never really felt guilt. If I try to recall a story from the past, you know, a long time ago, I was always very aware of my, you know, like I try to think back to, you know, my first sexual encounter was with my first love. Mm -hmm. And before that, and we were pretty young, but before that I had women that were trying to be intimate with me and I wouldn't even touch them. Like I just never was really that kind of person. I always knew from a young age, like that's just something that's very sacred to mm -hmm. me. I could feel that. And so I never engaged in those things. But it's the same thing with, like we were talking about earlier, with substances or anything. Until we're aware, we're not aware. And there's nothing wrong with that. So there's, it's leading us to our awareness. So even if somebody has to be intimate with a thousand people, you know, in five years, it's fine. It lead them, let them to where they are now and understanding who they are now. And there's nothing wrong with that. So it doesn't matter if it's watching it or, you know, whatever way it's it's helping them to understand themselves it doesn't matter there should be no guilt there there's nothing guilt's not real guilt's not real it's just a word it's just a word that we associate with a feeling that we think other people are experiencing yeah that we but it just means that we don't feel good yeah yeah but I, we should never feel good because the past is leading us to what we need to know now so guilt is just a word that shouldn't even really exist so, yeah, in my own personal experience, there were certain things that I've just come to know as I intuitively did when I was just born. Yeah. I just was born into those, those understandings. So now, you know, that's a very sacred act and it can, in most sex, like, you know, I don't, I talk, I've talked about it with people, people have asked me questions, but sex can be so much more than how most people interact with it or engage with it. Like, Meaning 
there is a spiritual connection and interaction and experience that can be had through sex that is unlike what most people can even fathom. But you have to know yourself at that level before you can experience with another. Yeah, it's, you have it's to, like, and that, that goes with love too. You know, you like you have to be, know love first. You have to love yourself before you can love anyone else or be loved by anyone else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, that's that's well said too. So, yeah. Yeah, but like yeah. I said, I, I go back to everything, kind of summarize it all. There's nothing wrong with anything. You know, why do we have, why do people have interactions? Why do people have these conversations? Just for better understanding of self, but guilt, negativity, bad things, like it's just a perception at the time. It's all beautiful. It's all perfect. And everybody's always getting what they want. They just have to let it in. They just have to let it in. And we're coming into a time where people are realizing that and just don't give attention. There's one thing I could say to anybody, whatever's going on in the, the world that you don't like, just don't give attention to it. Yeah. And change yourself and those things will change. Those things will peter out. And Absolutely. if you feel like it's a responsibility for you to do something about it, if you feel truly called and it's joyous and it feels like fun to do it, then do it. But if it doesn't, then don't. Don't. <laughs> don't. Yeah. No reason. Own, own your peace. Own your strength. Yeah. Follow your joy. Follow your bliss. Follow your heart. 100%. Yeah. Well, Jeffrey, that's all I got for you. And that there's, unless there's anything else that you want to speak about, uh, but where, where can everyone find you? Where, what are, uh, what, what are your socials? What websites do you have? I, I'd love to uh, help you get plugged in with people. Yeah. So, you know, this last year I've been doing um, a lot of things. Um, I was doing retreats with Odette um, and that's something that I really have passion about this last year. I was uh, doing probably like four or five different endeavors. And so I only have two things online. And that is uh, my website, which has some of our yoga and meditation offerings, as well as some retreat stuff. And we don't have any planned right now, but that's yumiverseyoga.com. And then my social, which I use periodically, is just referee jobber, R-E-F-F-R-E-Y-J-O-B-E-R-T. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, I share on there sometimes a lot and I won't share at all, but the way I've taught people over the last seven to 10 years is just, they just come into my experience and then I'll, I'll do that and I'll give attention to it again. And like I said, for me, it's the same thing. What gives me the most joy at any given time? And that's what I pursue. So when you came in that same day, there was like three people that came in and it felt like, okay, I need to express this and it's coming out of me and people are asking for it. So I still work one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, but I do plan on like making some courses. It's been in my intention for probably three to six months. And that way people can just go, go through some of these things that I feel like would kind of move them really fast with some of the breathing and meditation and yoga techniques. Um, and then if they would want to interact with me one-on-one, -on -one, they could. But it's also about creating a community, you know, as well. So however that unfolds, I'm not really sure. And that's kind of what the retreats are about. It's a community and it's fun and it's, you know, it's uplifting and people are learning and expanding themselves, but in a kind of joyous way, you know, and a beautiful places too. So, yeah. Well, Jeffrey, so, thank you so much for sharing your energy with me today. Of course, likewise. Honestly, brother, like I am so thankful that we met. I think you and I are aligned in, in so many ways and you've already been a tremendous blessing and motivator and friend in my life. So I thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you for your time you as well. for your insight. I hope this reaches people and helps people. That's the goal of why I do this. So for sure. Um, but yeah, I I hope you have a great rest of your day, man. Thank you. Thank you as well. I appreciate you so very much. And thank you for having me. All right. See you. All right. Bye.